Hey guys, I'm Perry Nemiroff, and welcome back to Collider Best of the Week, the place to go if you don't have enough time to watch all the shows on the Collider Videos YouTube channel or to read all the written features over on Collider.com and you want some of the best of the best right in one spot. We're going to roll right into this and go to Movie Talk where the group was talking about the news that Star Wars Rogue One might not feature the iconic Star Wars opening crawl. I, for one, would rather it be in there because I don't want it to break from tradition, but let's see what the panel thought. I think that they're going to lean towards keeping the crawl text in there. I know that the crawl text isn't used in Rebels. I know that there's a lot of other Star Wars stuff like the comic books where they do use the crawl text and, of course, in the main films. But I think it's the right idea to keep the crawl text in there. If for no other reason, because look, we're going to a galaxy far, far away. It is great to have a little bit of context, especially when you consider that all of these Star Wars anthology or story films are gonna be one-offs. Maybe they spin off into their own franchise, mm -hmm. like you have three Han Solo movies or three Obi-Wan movies, but for Rogue One, it'd be nice to get some backstory in here so that the characters don't have to waste 20 or 30 minutes explaining all of that stuff and we can get right into the action. On the one hand, I do think that that establishes that it's part of this universe and it, it is. It's part of that movie going experience to watch the, mo the credits roll here comes the crawl text. But on the other hand, I do understand kind of the idea of keeping the, that separate. Um, and I wonder if they don't do the crawl text, if they would um, initiate or bring in another type of background story. Because I think what you are, or means of delivering the background, because I think what you're saying is really important. The idea that you have to set up exactly where we are in the Star Wars universe and then launch into it. You know what? You convinced me that I think that it has to have the, the crawl. Originally, I was I was like, I don't, I don't know if uh, I really care that much. It's called a Star Wars story. Are they going to still have Star Wars come out, but a story underneath it? Mm -hmm. when it? That would be weird. It should still say Star Wars when we see the film. And then if it does have the crawl, we, I don't know if we, it's necessary for it to say a Star Wars story within the crawl. You just say Rogue, Rogue One. Rogue One, and then, but I think you're right, man. As you probably know, the Batman v Superman Ultimate Cut came out on digital HD this week. So that was a big topic of conversation on this week's Heroes. In an effort to avoid including spoilers on this show, we are just gonna share John Schnepp's general reaction to that cut of the film. But I highly recommend checking out the full discussion on Heroes. And we also have a spoiler-filled review up with Schnepp, Dennis, Umberto, and Steve Weintraub. So check that out as well. But here is a brief preview of the discussion on Heroes. If you watch Collider Heroes, you know I didn't like the uh, Batman v Superman theatrical cut. And I heard that they were coming out with this ultimate edition. I was like, well, what's it really going to do? How much can you really change in a movie that's already two and a half hours by adding 30 minutes? Mm -hmm. And especially by adding sequences to certain scenes that I thought were already a lost cause as far as script wise, which was the Africa sequence, the bullet, certain things like that. I was like, oh, they're going to flesh it out. I was like, really? Do I want to see 30 more minutes of that? Well, honestly, to be blunt, I actually really liked this version of Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. And this is from now on the only version I'll ever rewatch because what the theatrical uh, release did was uh, hack up a film uh, and destroy it to me, at least as, a, as for, from my own perspective, uh, it was just, it, so many of the scenes didn't have any of the weight that they carry now with the extra 30 minutes. And it's because the extra 30 minutes add like little 10 seconds here or 15 seconds there, or they rearrange and move a whole scene earlier and then it plays naturally. So honestly, it, the three hour film feels shorter than the two and a half hour film, which is weird because the flow of the film now makes total sense and builds with the characters where you are, actually start to care about Clark Kent because there's a lot of scenes that are added to his relationship with Lois, mm -hmm. him actually going to Gotham to find out who this Batman character is. A lot of things like, why wouldn't he know who Batman is? Well, maybe Batman hasn't been very active and all of a sudden has become very active. And now he's trying to write a story about who is this Batman? Why is he branding people? This week on Jedi Council, we're gonna highlight the part of the show where the group talked about how Mon Mothma is getting a significantly larger role in Rogue One than she got in Return of the Jedi. Let's check it out. This is what we thought we were getting in episode three. We right. thought we were going to get a lot of Mon Mothma and we got nothing. We got a deleted scene that we you can watch on YouTube. You don't even, you hardly, maybe she showed up for a second or two in, in the, the theatrical cut, but this is something that we want. This is the same actress that played her in episode three, so that's nice to see. And then knowing what happens in the other canon 
different stuff, knowing where she goes from after Return of the Jedi to see, every, I think it's going to have that much more of an impact when you go back and watch the original trilogy to see what kind of impact she has in Rogue One and then watching her again when mm -hmm. she shows up in Return of the Jedi, I think it's going to be, it, it's a smart play. What do you think, Ralph? Yeah, absolutely. I remember loving her in, in Jedi and being fascinated by her and wanting to know more backstory. So I think this is a great opportunity to take a character that is on the periphery and give her much more to do and, and create somebody else that we can attach to. You know? Tiff? I totally agree. I think it's one of those things too, especially if you talk about, oh, there's not enough female characters in Star Wars. This is a character that was already there. It's only smart to, for them to develop the story more because she does have a huge impact, even though we don't see her that much in the original films. And from an actor standpoint, you're like, thank God this girl is getting this because last time, how excited are you? I booked Star Wars and then they're like, oh, you got cut. And then it's like, I'm gonna be in Rogue One. I'm like a lot. Yeah. <laughs> this makes so much sense. That was actually my like one verbal reaction because I was so awestruck watching the first Rogue One trailer is I was just like, oh, I'm on Mothma. So it's nice to see that thing that I know because I know who <laughs> she is already. And it feels like she would have a huge import, mm -hmm. but we've already seen how good she is at stealing plans or acquiring information that she's not supposed to have. So that she's one of the masterminds behind this initial idea to steal the Death Star plans makes total sense in the universe. There's still no official word on what the theme of American Horror Story Season 6 is going to be besides that really brief question mark tease that FX threw out this week. So on Collider Nightmares, we all threw out some ideas of what we want the theme to be. But if I had to narrow it down to one theme that I want to see, it's Sleepaway Camp. I knew nice. you were going to flip out when I said that. But That was mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. That's man. exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, my God. So now you don't have to go to me. Just well, listen to Barry. In addition to just loving Friday the 13th, I went to sleepaway camp and in sleepaway camp, my favorite thing in the world was the Cropsy legends. It was mm. always like, oh, it's an orange moon. Oh, yeah, Cropsy's yeah. coming to get you. And I, I just love those sleepaway camp legends. Cause you know, you're away from home and you're all by yourself and you're out in the woods and God knows what can happen. And like kids go on raids from one bunk to the next in the middle of the night. There's just so many things to explore. Cryptozoic. Uh, you know, camp. I don't know. <laughs> 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 monsters, like, just go out in the woods and have some fun. The one I was thinking about is like, do it in an office. Ooh, like just an it. office horror because <laughs> so many people are stuck in their shitty cubicles. <laughs> you might as well make a musical about it and have this dude do it. So that's what I would do. Is I know they're talking about doing a musical. Rock that shit in an office, son, and then murders await. Um, my thought was uh, Lovecraft. Oh, great. Yeah. Doing great. a full on New England set, Lovecraftian, you know, kind of cosmic story uh, where you can allude to Cthulhu and you can allude to all of these, you know, unknown horrors and embrace what True Detective wound up not embracing fully. Mm. You know? Providence, if you yeah. haven't been checking yeah, that out. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mine Thanks. is um, basically, well, it's what I want, to, is where I want to see the Purge franchise go. So if you're listening, Mr. Turek, uh, I want small town farm politics, horror, all of that. Like, you know your neighbor, can you trust your neighbor? No one's no one's out there and you're so alone in the middle of nowhere. And I want it set at Halloween time, so there's scarecrows and the, you know, that's what I want. Time for a brand new section of Collider Best of the Week for one of our brand new shows. It's the Top 10 Show with John Roca and Matt Nose. The way that one works is that they pick a topic, each of them picks their own top 10 list for that topic, and then they hash it out on the show. This week, the topic is Steven Spielberg movies, and in an effort not to spoil the entire list, we're just gonna focus on the first movie they discovered, so let's roll it. My number 10 yes. uh, is Close Encounters of the Third Kind. All right, that's my number nine. We can talk about it. Oh, that's your number nine. Yes, it is. That moved down in rankings. It rank did. For you. Well, don't we're not. I don't know what you're talking about. This is a whole new list. <laughs> it's true. So now we're just wiping that memory. Yeah, gone. Absolutely. I apologize. I had I one of those realize. neuralizers on my brain. All right. So it's what sucked me into, like I don't know, the idea of space, like aliens coming here, yeah. and just the simple, like oh, it, how it could manifest itself and people be drawn to it, just unknowingly, and that kind of mystery about all of it. Yeah. Like maybe it could go down like that. I have no idea, but I was young enough to see it that I was entranced. Yeah. I remember studying, I took a class uh, when I was at Florida State over the summer, and I studied Spielberg. It was, it was a, an entire class on Spielberg. Mm -hmm. The syllabus was like 300 pages. It was insane. And one of the films that really, I didn't understand how much what was into this film was Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Yeah. I had no idea that the ending uh, music sequences were about a tribute to his parents, his mom and his dad. How yeah. they communicated, uh, that is his mom and dad speaking to each other. The lighter notes being the mom, the heavier bass notes being the dad. All that kind of, Francois so Truffaut's in the film. So his mom is Charlie Brown's teacher? I don't 
That's what I didn't know that. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. That's very well said. Yeah, very it's amazing. Well said. He's been part of our lives now for numerous Absolutely. generations. Plus, people love it for the mashed potatoes. And it's Richard Dreyfus not like he's being the lead in this film in a way that he hadn't been in any other film, I think, in my opinion. And the yeah. work done by him. And then you have the D. Wallace storyline going on with the little kid. Uh -huh. It's just really endearing the stuff you go through. And the special effects still hold up today. They, do. they really the do. The truck sequence totally holds up. Potential big news for anyone who is still watching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. San Diego is currently turning into San Diego Comic-Con, so that means artwork is going up, and a piece of artwork for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. possibly teased the introduction of Ghost Rider on the show, so let's see what the panel thought about that one. Sinead and I uh, are the only ones, uh, I mean, I know there are a lot of people that still watch Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but on this panel, we I'm the one that stayed true, but I will say it's sort of like a, a an ex-girlfriend that I keep going back and like stalking her Instagram. Like At one point, I was definitely in love with her and I'm like sometimes she posts a great picture right. but there are a lot of you episodes you just like want to check in on yeah them. just let me check yeah but I mean I this whole season I thought of Agents not of like S.H.I.E.L.D. not like I do that or anything what? Like have like I done that before? shut up sorry um, <laughs> but uh, I was down in San Diego on Wednesday and we and we saw the train go by because we were you know they're starting to put up all like the signs for Comic Con and everything and, and the city's like really starting to prepare and so that train goes by and, and I was with John Campia and he said holy cow look at the it's an Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. train I was like awesome and then it goes by again and, and we all looked at it there was four of us and we're like is that like a Ghost Rider chain on there? And I was like, Ghost Rider's not in the show. Oh man! And then so I, then I go on Twitter or whatever, and it's and then Dennis slacks me and he's like, it's, it's, Ghost Rider is going to be on Agents of Shield. And I was like, this is awesome. However, in this past season, possible spoiler alert: they have this guy James, and he, everything he touches basically blows up. Like he puts things and he just throws it, and it's a bomb. And there's a point where he has like a flaming chain that he throws, and it's sort of night oh, so Ghost Rider esque. Okay. So it could be him, but. If you want to get fans back on board or say fans that like maybe didn't per se love the end of season three or, you know, where this like the next meta human things are going to go um, or in humans. What do they call them on agency of meta humans? I get confused with DC. What do they call them on uh, meta humans on Flash, right? Yeah, meta humans is DC. Right. So in humans yeah. is, is Marvel. Um, I, I'm all for it. Cast Nicolas Cage. I mean, the guy hasn't really been in much lately. So. If they put Nicolas Cage on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the I will world watch, will lose I will watch all the their show. <laughs> I will I actually swear. watch the show. Like, if you guys put Nicolas Cage on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., I will start from the beginning. I will binge the entire thing, and I will get up to Ghost Rider. Yeah. I will also have a Ghost Rider marathon at my house before it goes down. Maybe I'll also do a little bit National Treasure. I will totally, I would watch the show. And if it's anybody but Nicolas Cage, I'm never watching you, Agents <laughs> of S.H.I.E.L.D., and you can kiss my butt. Now it's time for the Collider.com portion of the show when we get to highlight some written features done by the team over there. We're going to kick things off with some Game of Thrones coverage because season six wrapped up with one heck of an episode this week, and it shakes things up big time on the show in terms of who's got the best shot at claiming the Iron Throne. In Alison Keene's Power Rankings piece, she ranks where everyone stands, including how Star Stark, House Tyrell, and more. Also for Game of Thrones, we've got a piece titled Everything We Didn't See in the Season 6 Finale from Dave Trumbor. He runs through all the key characters and big storylines that are not part of Winds of Winter, why it's good, why it's bad, and what it might mean for Season 7. This probably goes without saying, but these articles contain Season 6 spoilers, so if you are not caught up on the show, you might want to save these two for later. This next one's a big one from Allison Keene and Chris Cabin. They picked the best episodes of TV of the year so far. They're going to do a part two for the second half of the year in December, but for now they run through some of the best episodes from Daredevil, The Girlfriend Experience, American Crime Story, and more. If you're not happy that a certain movie was left off the top 10 show ranking, you might want to check out Matt Goldberg's list of Steven Spielberg movies ranked from worst to best. I don't know if I'd be as hard on The Lost World as Matt was, but head on over to Collider.com to see how the rest of the Spielberg movies stacked up for him. Are you a big fan of Leica films like Coraline, Paranorman, and The Box Trolls? You're going to want to check out Haley Fouch's set visit right up for their next feature, Kubo and the Two Strings. She got to visit their Portland-based studio and saw the puppet sets, costumes, props, and spoke to the creative team behind the film. This week on the Schmodown, we have Mark Ellis versus JTE, round two. Can JTE steal another one from Mark Ellis? Let's check out a preview. You're marked for death when it comes to the Schmodown. I'm out for justice. So I have a competition in me, a fire down below, that I'm going to grab from to take you down, okay? I'm hard to kill when it comes to movie trivia. I'm not losing. The fact is, he's not a top 10 kind of fighter. He's simply not. When he wins, there's always question marks around it. Did he cheat? Did he deflate the ball? You know what you're getting with JT, a guy who's going to cheat his way to the top. Me, 
I'm just going to be at the top. He is the 2015 Team Schmodown finalist. He is Little Evil J.T. E. There he is, all runs out, always ready. Oh, he has a lot of energy. He is ready to go. There's no, no pre-match nerves. No. He is the reigning movie trivia schmodown team champion, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Baby Carrots Ellis. There he is, relaxed, cool, Com and confident. All oh, the beach music playing hard. What comedy had the tagline, 3% body fat, 1% brain activity? Zoolander? Correct for the first correct first answer of the day. The oh, booing. There's a lot of booing here happening. <laughs> Finish the quote in the film Tombstone. I'm your... That would be Huckleberry. That is correct. For his One first of correct Mark answer Ellis of the day. First point. Now it's time for Meme of the Week, the time on the show when we get to highlight some of the memes and artwork you guys sent in that comes from something that happened on one of our shows. And this week's winner is Michael Gullick, who sent in a little something that shows what happens when poor Mark Ellis is surrounded by shit rats. Thanks so much for sending that one in, Michael. If you want your artwork featured on this show, it's really easy. All you got to do, watch a show, pick a moment, and then make up some art and send it on over to mailbag at collider.com. Or you can tweet it at us using the hashtag Collider Best of the Week. We've got another music poll for you, just like we did with Collider Nightmares. We're going to pick some new original music for Collider Best of the Week. That was all done by my good friend Ryan Levy of the band Braves. It's going to work the same exact way. We are going to play the music for you here. There's three options, and you guys have to vote. This time, no poll, because that clearly confused many of you. So we are going to ask you to pick your option and put it right in the comment section below, and then I will count them up. I can't do math, but I can count, so I got you covered. Before we move on to the part of the show that I'm sure you are all eagerly awaiting, we want to highlight a giveaway that we're doing right now. It's for the movie Carnage Park, which I absolutely love. I think you should see it. And if you want to see it with me, John Schnepp, Mark Riley, and the director of the movie, Mickey Keating, we're doing a giveaway where you can enter to win tickets to a screening in LA on Wednesday, July 6th. Keywords in LA. Don't enter unless you live in the LA area and can come. All you have to do if you want to come see the movie with us is you tweet at Collider Video and you just say that you want to come and make sure to throw in the hashtags Collider Nightmares and Carnage Park. Now that that's taken care of, let's do it. Blooper time. I know kids like building stuff. They're like, look at this weird cave I built. I... <laughs> Screw <laughs> off, man. I hate Minecraft. Hey guys, for Collider News, I'm Kara. <laughs> yeah, also here is the oldest man in the room, and probably like in what are you Burbank. About? In, in, uh, in the world. I feel like I'm just like choking on a dick through this whole thing with all these names. I'm like, oh, oh. So you got uh, Mr. Garmin here. He's, he's very good. You listen to him, what he does. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. How's that sound, Frank? You like that? I like to make my tweets about certain things right after shows to be way more vague more of a joke Thank you. than she's got the <laughs> hips and they're <laughs> I was like it doesn't that doesn't Oops, that does have... nothing Fuck. for anyone spoiler <laughs> alert totally ruined that whole spot. is this a mic noise <laughs> supernaturals Jared Pedalecki but that's the one that's the one <laughs> just told kids to screw up yeah all you kids building little dumb 2600 <laughs> art caves and look at my strange box that I've I'm inside. Kick a soccer ball. Yeah. Following pretty far behind is Independence Day Resurgence with a four 
Walking Cox. You know, it's funny that you, you know, bring these things up because I was talking to my good friend James Cameron, you know, about your little show here, and he thinks it's not very visually interesting, you know. He thought there are other shows, you know, on, on the internet that are so much, you know, more visually interesting. I mean, Did he just get a vinyl reference in in under a minute? That is that like a land speed record? Was that a vinyl I record? I didn't say anything that about fast? that. I didn't say anything about vinyl. I remember Sinead's great great grandmother. She was she wasn't as much of a smart ass as this one. Let me just tell you. This, is, this has gotten worse progressively through the descendants. Let me just tell you. You asshole, Jared Padalecki. Wait, wait. Hashtag John Schnepp hates my cave. Uh, <laughs> Disgust. 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 <laughs> Hey, Junior. I'm We're talking before, we're talking about Chewy, talking about Han, talking about Chan. You do it. It was actually an, an old mistress of mine that came in and used to call it Chan, but no one knew about it. Like, it's going to be vicious. It's going to be violent. Yeah. Do you guys like the way this looks? Yes, you do. And giving that little push Anakin needed to fall to the dark side when he asked him to kill Palpatine. Yes, it was Palpatine. Quit shaking your head at me over there. I really hope you get tweets of, why do you hate my cave? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I just hope that just keeps coming I hate in. your cave. I'm primed, I'm ready, I'm lubed up. Let's do this. What? <laughs> Round two. 40 guests for the whopping price of $1 million. Dollars? <laughs> Now there will be Smurfs yeah. in Dungeons yeah. and Dragons. I mean, I guess it's. I'll give it a high. I mean, it's not vinyl, but you know, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll watch it. Thought we had an agreement. Thought we were friends. I'll watch it. Harry, you look like you want to say something. For more on these Magic Mike stage shows that can take all of my money right now, head on over to Collider.com and be sure to fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> I don't care about this movie. I think it's stupid. And also, screw off, kids. But in... <laughs> yeah. That's the wrap on this week's episode of Collider Best of the Week. You guys know what to do. Sound off in the comments section below and share some of your favorite moments from this week's lineup of shows. I am Perry Nemiroff. You can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at P Nemiroff. And be sure to bookmark Collider.com. Subscribe to the Collider Videos YouTube channel. Watch and read everything. But just in case you don't have enough time, that's what Best of the Week is for. Have a great holiday weekend, everyone. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.